okay, this store is going to expose this uh, drug rehab company, Cinecore, for uh, what's basically like a modern day style convict leasing. And it also will just reiterate that the last provision of the 13th Amendment that states that um, slavery and indentured servitude is abolished unless, here's the caveat, unless if you commit a crime, then you belong to them, then you belong to the state. See, it took, it took slavery out of the private sector and it put slavery in the public sector if you commit one of their crimes, one of their, one of their, or if you commit a crime and you break one of their laws, but then the state now having you as a slave or as a involuntary indentured servant could put you out into the private sector. So there's this company, Cinecore, there's probably other companies like this across the country, but this one is maybe one of the largest of them all. And it's been found that they're rehab program scheme is most likely illegal and un unconstitutional and they're exploiting that last provision of the 13th amendment now people in this program have been assigned to work assignments as a part of the the, re the conditions to the rehab program and a number of the assignments has been um you know, working in Walmart uh, warehouses, working in oil platforms for shale. Uh, there's a Exxon refinery, uh, refinery center along the Mississippi River. And you've had people who've had all types of things happen, you know, working unsupervised, working without proper training and safety equipment. There's been lots of different injuries. You had an individual who he broke his back falling from a tree he didn't have the proper rigging or equipment and he fell from a tree. This was in uh, Baton Rouge when he was trimming and cutting trees. Uh, they were working in flood homes in 2016, dealing with black mold and raw sewage. Once again, without proper uh, safety equipment, without proper training, without proper supervision. And, and when you talk about these flood homes, there's uh, federal requirements that are in place as well as local requirements when you work with black mold and raw sewage and flood houses. In 1995, there was even a situation where a worker fell from a platform working in an office supply warehouse. And this company has been cited uh, for many violations over the past couple of decades and nothing really has changed. Now, uh, Seneca basically works with uh, 300 different for-profit companies with these um, rehab work programs. Now, the success rate of a lot of these rehab work programs is only about 8%. So the rescindancy rate is gonna be very high. Uh, now, there's a little bit of a tie-in to just the drug addiction problem, especially the opioid epidemic that America has. And you need to understand that there's a lot of big money going into this. Uh, just like with the healthcare system in this country, with insurance and with big pharma, it's not a very lucrative business model to cure people and to treat people. Because if people are always having problems, or if people are always sick, if you have that business, you're gonna get the money. If people don't get sick, if people are cured, if people receive the treatment and they don't really need any more treatment anymore, there's, no, there's not gonna be any more money coming in. So a healthy and a sober, a wellness society is not very good for these big corporations. So just like they wanna treat the symptoms they don't want to cure you or they don't want to give you a permanent treatment. Same thing here specifically when you're talking about rehab. Um, they really don't want to cure you with the rehab centers. You know, they like the, re the rescindancy. They like the relapses. You know, they like people falling off the wagon because that's more people getting back through the revolving door of their scheme. 
so they can make money. So they make a lot of money. Uh, I think just on these um, these work programs, Cinecor made, I think, seven uh, billion dollars alone last year just off of that. Okay, so this is very big money. Now, if you have someone who, or if there's just someone who's gone into one of these programs voluntarily, okay, through your own means, in this situation, it's kind of like a buyer beware situation. You just have to do your homework. You just need to make sure that you're signing up for the right program, that you're asking for results, you're asking for tangibles, you're looking for a track record. Uh, that shows that the people who go there get the help that they get. But what I really want to mainly focus on is the people who didn't have a choice. People who were court ordered or as a, a part of their probation or even a violation of their probation, you have to go through these programs. And what happens is that to stay compliant, you have to do what they tell you to do. You don't really have a choice. It's all court ordered. It's not voluntary. You know, it's not like paying for a service in the free market or free enterprise. It's not like that. This is the state. So now the people are paid by these companies when they're doing their work, but the contract that they sign with these rehab programs and Cinecor is that your pay has to it has to go to the expenses that is covered by Cinecor and these other rehab programs. And they found that in many cases that the money that they raked in from the salaries was two to one when it comes to the actual expenses. Now, the, it seems the two biggest states where this was really a big issue, at least with Cinecor, was Texas and Louisiana. And as someone once told me, uh, especially when it comes to the, the, the penal system, that Texas is the true slave state when it comes to that. Now, in the when you look at state laws, Louisiana, um, Louisiana, you have to disclose, you know, injuries and certain financials when it comes to these rehab programs. But in the state of Texas, you don't have those requirements. So Texas, they can do whatever they want to do, okay? So when you look at this story, this is basically just like a modern day style of convict leasing. And when you look at people who have been adjudicated, when you look at uh, probation requirements, when you look at potential violation of probation, you know, it invokes that last provision of the 13th Amendment where if you're in violation, you are a slave or an indentured servant to the state and all those rights or privileges are waived and you belong to them and they can basically do to you what they wanna do because you're a slave. Now you're not a privatized slave like it was before, but you are a slave to the state, okay? You're a slave to the penal code system. And if you want to stay compliant within that system, you have to do what they tell you to do. So, I mean, this, this company, Cinecor, has, they've done fundraisers. They've taken in so much money from people who think that they're giving to philanthropy and donating. And all the while, they're making money hand over fist by taking advantage with these uh, rehab work programs. You know, a lot of these people with convictions or being on probation, they can't get normal jobs in the private sector uh, on their own. So this is the way that uh, they can get employed through these programs. And it makes you think when they talk about the unemployment numbers, uh, how many of these individuals are in these rehab work programs with these types of companies? And they otherwise wouldn't, have been, wouldn't be hired in the private sector if it, were, if it were not for these programs and how do these programs tie in to how the employment numbers, the unemployment rate gets tabulated. Uh, there was one worker who was talking about he worked 43 days straight 
without um, without a day off. People who work 10 hour days plus, you know, things that you wouldn't deal with in normal situations. We're working on we're working on a regular job in the private sector. Even in a, now, this company is considered to be a not-for-profit company, even though they contract and do turnkey services to private sector companies. So, in 1985, there was a Supreme Court ruling that stated that even in a situation where if someone is working, considered an employee, not volunteering, if someone is doing some type of an employee work for a, a not-for-profit organization, that they still have all those same labor rights, legal protections as anyone else. So even in these instances where they're doing work connected with a rehab program that's a not-for-profit company, they're, and they're being contracted or subcontracted out to private sector companies, you know, so basically uh, this, 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 this organization is like a like a staffing company in a way when it comes to rehabs you still have all those same legal rights you still have all those same legal protections you know and while these people yes are being paid the umbrella company Cinecor and these other rehab companies not for profits they're saying well we're just simply charging them for the expenses you know of their housing of their treatment, of uh, maybe any, any medicine, you know, anything they would say would be an, ex an expense of doing these programs. You know, and at the end of the day, these people don't really see any money because the, the money goes to the expenses and then there goes your paycheck. So I did, I mean, I did a little bit more digging to see if they're were any other similar stories connected to this other than, than just this one company, uh, uh, not-for-profits, um, and even more than just Texas and Louisiana. It looks like uh, some of the models for some of these rehab programs in Florida uh, has, surprise, surprise, Florida. Florida has um, some of the highest cases of this. And at the state of Florida, kind of set the model for a lot of these rehab work programs as well as you know like the halfway houses and stuff like that and um, rehab residences across the country so if there's any um, if I get any any more information or any new stories comes up I will do a follow-up on this because like I say this is basically like a modern day convict leasing and they're always able to find a way to get around the system and, 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 and uh, take advantage of these loopholes but once again you know when you have that last provision of the 13th amendment it you don't really have to go that hard to um, to uh, to really uh, exploit any of the loopholes you know and of all of these court cases that you hear about, you know, all these, con you know, all these constitutional cases and federal cases that come up, you know, I haven't really seen too much, you know, and, and different rulings you've had based upon certain statutes and the Constitution. I haven't really have seen anyone using any arguments talking about that last provision of the 13th Amendment. I mean, there's, no there's really nothing you can do about it right now because it's on the books, it's the law of the land, so you can't just take it out and say that's not right. You would need, that would need to be changed. And the only way to really get it done is that you would need a constitutional amendment. And this is what, you know, the certain rapper who at one point in time was going around wearing a MAGA hat, you know, this is what the point that he was trying to make, although he didn't really speak to it that well. I'm gonna clean it up. The point he was trying to make is that if you're gonna to continue to have that provision on the books, then it's taking away the spirit or the intent of what it was supposed to be. Now, maybe it was one of these compromises or maybe it was something that was taken out of context, but it is what it is. And now 
you need to make the adjustment. You need to make the reform. So if you want to make the change, you're going to need a constitutional amendment to take that last provision out where it says, unless you commit a crime. It, it just needs to say that slavery and indentured servitude is abolished, period, full stop. You know, no caveats, no qualifiers, no exceptions, no stipulations, no loopholes, no none of that, just full stop. And then maybe you can get further into trying to challenge this stuff. But like I say, I have, I, you know, I mean, I try to pay attention to a lot of these court cases that come up, but I've just not seen too many federal court cases where people bring this up and where they uh, invoke that last provision of the 13th Amendment. You know, people don't want to talk about it. Because when you look at the profiteering and the racketeering that goes in place with convicts, with the probation system, with the bond system, modern day convict leasing, even the original convict leasing, that was the first loophole, that was the first exploitation right there, you know, and even with the subsequent um, civil rights legislation that we had, even prior to the 1940s and the 1950s and the 1960s, there was civil rights legislation that was taking place in the 1800s, even before you had all of these other things, even before some of these constitutional amendments took place. That was supposed to cut this stuff out. But if you don't really change the Constitution, then it's not going to matter. So you still have slavery in America. You still have indentured servitude in America. And by way of the last provision of the 13th Amendment, it is legal. It is constitutional. So I know a lot of people trying to say that this might be illegal or this might be unconstitutional. But technically, it's not. And unless there's going to be some, some, some legal challenges that's going to take place, I don't think anything's gonna change. So, specifically, if you have a family member who's been convicted, who's been, or you know, you yourself, or a family member, or a loved one, who's been convicted, if they've been adjudicated, you know, or if they're on probation, or they're maybe in a potential violation on probation, you need to look into this. You need to see what the stipulations may be. You need to see what the requirements may be. Uh, I know some of these things aren't easy when you talk about these uh, public defense attorneys, but you need to ask questions, you know, and you need to follow up on these things, you know. Now, once again, like I say, if you break a law, you know, if you're convicted or you plead guilty, if you're adjudicated, legally, I don't know if there's really too much you could do, especially if you can't afford good legal representation because you belong to them now. You're a slave or an indentured servant of the state. But at least you need to ask questions and see if there's maybe a possible recourse or if there's something else that could be done, if there's some alternatives, you know, uh, try to push, you know, this public defense attorney to do the best that you can. Uh, see if, if you're not pleased with the public defender that has been assigned see if maybe if you can get a different one or something like that see if there's maybe some programs out there that helps cover legal fees for people who can't afford it people who are poor people who don't have resources you know if you can afford your own resources and if you or if you can afford your own private attorney you know chances are you're probably going to get put in a much better situation but it's but particularly for poor people if you can't afford it you're at the mercy of the system you're at the mercy of the state. But arm yourself with knowledge and education. You know, arm yourself with, with, with knowledge and ask questions and do a follow-up. Just don't, I mean, I know it's not maybe the easiest thing to do, but do the best that you can for yourself, for your loved ones, for your family members. Because if you let the system swallow them up, they're just gonna chew them up and spit them out.
you know, and it's just going to be an ongoing revolving cycle, okay? So, until the next time, family, Shalom.